Welcome to the Ninja Coaching Coast to Coast podcast, where our mission is to help you learn and grow by sharing the tips, ideas, tricks, and more that we learn from speaking with top producing real estate agents around the country every single day. I'm Matt Benelli here with Ninja Coaching founder and owner Garrett Fry. And although we focus a lot on real estate, this podcast is not just for real estate agents. It is for anyone who is looking to better their business and increase their income per hour in order to enjoy all of the things that life has to offer. So prepare to take in a lot of value that you can put into action in your business and your life. Enjoy the show. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, Garrett Fry here. We are today going to jump into value in between sales because it's an area that we find a lot of agents completely miss the mark on. They get hooked in on that one sale, and once that sale's done, they cut net and they take off and they're gone. So, uh, excited that we're going to go down this topic. Mac, what do you think? I'm really pumped about this one because this is such a a important thing for agents to be engaged in, and they always miss the mark on this. And the stats show this. I mean, consistently, the National Association of Realtors Profile of Home Buyers and Sellers, which will be coming out again very soon, consistently shows that well over 80%, sometimes over 85% of buyers and sellers probably or definitely would recommend or use their real estate agent again, but ultimately, less than 25%, sometimes less than 20% of people actually do. And it's always because the agents don't stay in good touch. They don't stay in flow with their people. Yeah, it's kind of sad when you spend three, you know, let's say three, Three months on average, the, the agent will spend with their client. You know, you get to know them and you know what's going on in their life. You know what, what all the happenings they got going on. And the minute we get a paycheck, we take off. Like I've always looked at that and gone like, what a sad situation. It's the worst. We've, they've given so much of their time. And any of you guys out there who have bought and sold a home, you know how stressful that is. So to get all the way through that stressful time with somebody that you felt was in your corner and cared about you and they take off, it always made me stop and go, we are missing the boat when it comes to that. And if you just miss an opportunity for, I mean, you've spent those three months with, with these people. So you get to know these people pretty well. I mean, you're not going to be best friends all the time. Although some people do find their best friends through this business, but you're not going to be super best friends all the time, but you're creating this connection that is a stronger relationship than some of us have with our regular friends. And the opportunity there to continue to add value because you know who these people are is tremendous. I mean, why wouldn't you want to do it? because it's easy to do then. You have this relationship and it could lead to more referrals too. I mean, I don't want to bring business necessarily into it, but it is true. You maintain these good relationships ongoing. You as a real estate agent can get more business from it too. Well, yeah. And so it goes to the hunter-gatherer approach, which we talk about in Ninja. So we've got the hunter-gatherers out there and we have the farmers. And this is not farming in the old-fashioned sense of the word farming with real estate. I'm talking about the good old-fashioned farmer, you know, hat on, overalls, you know, that kind of farmer. You know, the hunter gather, they're just going out there and they're looking for the next kill. They're looking for the next kill. They're looking for the little, you know, you know, the bush that's got the berries on it. We'll shake that thing around, get everything we can, and we'll move on to the next one. And what my my hope is we can get you guys just to see a little glimmer into our, on today's podcast is that there's so much opportunity with the people that are right in front of us and the ones that have done business with us. Those ones that they know we do a good job. You know, they're willing to tell their friends, you know, and we had so and so help us with our home and they were great and we love them. But the problem is we're not around anymore. We've left and we're gone. And when that opportunity comes up, they don't pass our name along. And why would they? I mean, over time that that just drops off farther and farther. CSU did the study on it. Larry and, and CSU did that together where they actually tracked how the drop off happens after the sale and how right up front people are in amazing refers. They will refer extremely well up front, and it doesn't take very long for them to drop off, even to the point that they'll badmouth us down the road if uh, if we let it go too long. And badmouthing could be as simple as, yeah, you know, Matt was a good realtor. He was a little slow in getting back to our emails, but um, you know, pretty good. All he did a great job, all in all. That that's badmouthing. So, Garrett, this is a topic that you've been wanting to talk about for a while, and we've kind of talked about different things, but where where does someone start? Where does an agent start? Transaction is coming to an end. How can they start to set themselves up so they can continue to 
add value now after that sale? So first things first, we don't spend enough time during the transaction really locking down the important pieces of what makes somebody who they are. You know, during the three months that we talked about there, you should know at the end of the transaction, I don't know, for me, when I was selling real estate, and I learned this actually from John Simmons when John Simmons was at the group in Fort Collins, you should know their favorite coffee drink. You should know maybe their favorite flowers. You should know that their kids play soccer. You should know that they like to play tennis on the weekends and, you know, like to play golf. You should know that their favorite places to travel to. You should know what kind of car they drive. You should know if they have dogs, horses, ducks, I don't know, whatever it is that makes them (laughs) who they are. And I think that that's where it starts. It starts with the relationship from the moment you meet them all the way through. And that's where people run the most Mm -hmm. amount of trouble is, is that they get to that closing table and all they've learned about them is that they want to buy a house or they want to sell a house. And they got nothing. To make a phone call after that, the only thing they can call and do is say, hey, how's the house? And you run out of those phone calls very quickly, like after that first one. (laughs) Yeah, it turns into anniversary calls is what it does. And then by that point, it's been a year. Now what do you do? So we need to start the value between sales really with what we're doing during the sale, creating that connection. So if you're working with somebody who is not a friend or a family member, you've met them because of your profession. You've met them because they've been referred to you or maybe they found you somehow. They walked into your office when you were on floor duty. You need to ask a lot of questions about them through this. And this can be done in, you know, you don't have to make this a formal process. Just when you're out showing homes, talk to them, ask questions, you know, tell me about the kids, tell me about what you guys do for work. I mean, you'll find that out anyways, if they're going to be getting a loan because, well, they're going to have to talk about that. Just ask those questions, right? And if you want to get really formal about it, uh, Matt, I don't know. Have you ever looked at the McKay 66? That's a form you've ever played with? I have looked at that, yes. That's old school. It was done back in the 80s. There's a whole lot of things on there that I don't think we need to go into. But the McKay 66 was made by Harvey McKay. Comes from a book that he wrote called How to Swim with the Sharks Without Being Eaten Alive. Do not go read the book. You don't need to read the book. But the McKay 66, you can Google it, and it's the 66 things you should know about your clients. When I first found that, that was kind of how I started of going like, okay. And I used this way before I was in Ninja. Uh, I was even involved with Ninja at all. I used to look at my clients and be like, okay, how much of this stuff can I figure out? How much can I figure about where they go to church, what their kids' names are, kids' birth dates? You know, do, do they smoke? Do they not smoke? Uh, do they drink? Do they not drink? And just keep going down that list. And uh, I've seen people overdo that list, by the way. I don't know, Matt, if you've ever seen that. I had one lady one time, she made a hundred file folders and she wrote the names of the clients on the top and she just put all the McKay 66 in each file folder. And she's like, I'm just going to keep, just keep filling it out. So I fill them all up on these people. <laughs> That's in, don't do that. <laughs> The best way to do it is when you know you're going to be going with, to a meeting with somebody, take a look at the McKay 66 and sit down and run down through and go, what are things I don't know about these people? You know, what are things that I'm not clear on? Well, I have no idea where they went to college. I don't know what they studied. I don't know where they grew up. Maybe I'll figure that out today. And I can usually, when I'm at lunch with somebody, I can just sit back and be like, no, where did you grow up? Did you grow up here in Reading or do you live somewhere? Like, where did you guys grow up at? And they're going, oh my gosh, we grew up on the East Coast. Really? Tell me about that. And all of a sudden you can dive in and learn a whole bunch of great stuff about people. So that's about as like if you want to like a simple system, that's a great way to start just to get your mind working in the right direction. Does that make sense? That does make sense. And for anybody who's Googling this right now, McKay is spelled M-A-C-K-A-Y. And now, Garrett, this also brings up the thought because I know that some people are going to go to this when they're thinking about it too. What about those worksheets that you can share with people and they can fill it out and put in their favorite color and their favorite food? And I mean, my opinion on that is I didn't use them. I rather just ask the question. If I don't know when their birthday is, I'll just ask them, you know, when's your birthday? When the time comes and it's appropriate to ask a question like that. But I mean, have you had people that you've worked with that have used those worksheets where they kind of share them with their clients and ask them to fill it out? You know, it's interesting. I have had people use them. I used to use it myself when I was selling real estate. I clearly remember. I mean, Matt, this was like, picture this. I was sitting at the table. She hands me the pre-listing packet because I'd sent it off to the house you know, before the actual meeting. 
I'm going through and I'm looking at the questionnaire and it, it's showing me, okay, dogs. And I got their dogs' names. They had this huge mastiff named, I think it was Princess, I think, back on it. It like <laughs> did, didn't fit. Didn't fit at all. Like a ma- huge, massive dog. And I looked down at her husband's name and on the nickname, it says Homer. And my brain's kind of going, Homer, like that's kind of a, like an interesting like nickname. Well, sure enough, at this moment, he's pulling up in the drive when he gets out of the car Spitting image of Homer Simpson, <laughs> hair, body type, everything. And he walked in the house and I said, I noticed on the sheet, your nickname is Homer. And I said, uh, can I call you Homer? He goes, all my friends do. I said, does that me? He goes, you can call me Homer. We were friends from that moment going forward. Now, would I have known that information without the checklist? No, probably not. It would take me a long time to dig that out. Uh, would I have known what their favorite restaurant was in town? Wouldn't have known that probably for a while. I probably could have figured it out through questions. I have found value in that. I think it's better if you can figure it out on your own through genuine curiosity. But I have had you know those systems work really well. well. But I like what you when you used it though. I'm not saying that I'm against these. I just never personally used them. But you used it at the pre-listing. You used it in your pre-listing packet where most agents that I know that use them will use it at the closing table. So they have the weight yes. of signing all these documents to buy this house or signing it to sell the house away. And then there's this questionnaire that pops up. And you've spent months with these people. And it's like, here's some more information I want to know about you. Whereas when you do it up front, it's like, I want to know this about you so that we can be connected. Whereas at the end, it's like, I want to know this about you so that I can follow up with you. And there's a different experience that gets associated with that. So if you're going to do it, I would do it like you and do it at the beginning. Well, I also found that there are certain things that if I learned it up front, I mean, I really want to get the listing. Like for me, I want to get the listing. Now, that listing, I didn't get it. And it wasn't because they went and listed with another person. It's because it was a 50-year-old manufactured house with aluminum wiring, and it was needed to be torn down. It didn't need to be sold. And in the end of the day, I could still call them on their anniversary, and I could still talk to them when their kids' birthdays were, and I could still stop by after they were rebuilding, and they built a new house on that lot and make fun of you know, the dogs and things like that. I had that, that knowledge in there that I would have never had if I would have just waited to the closing table because it would have never come. They never did a real estate transaction with me, but I still talk about them. I love it. still know who they are. We actually talked for years, actually. When I left Grants Pass and moved back down here, they actually reached out to me again, seeing if I was still in the area and if I could help them sell. And it was all because of that simple touch that I made with them up front so I could stay in touch with them long term. So now we have this information. We have this valuable information. We know a lot about our people through either using a sheet like that in the pre-listing up front or in your buyer interview or through asking questions throughout the time we spent with them. And now we're closing the transaction and it's time to stay in touch afterwards. Where do we start? Well, first off, I think we need to try to hold the personal relationship together as much as possible. I think a lot of us don't take the opportunity to uh, about a month or so after the sale to be like, I would love to see what you guys did with the house. I think we missed that opportunity. We helped them find this amazing place, but now we're just, again, we leave. Part of it is that personal side, but when we come to the house side, this is the other part that I think that we missed the boat on because we really need to be an advocate for these people. When it came to knowing how to be a homeowner, there's no manual. No. I can think of, out of all the homes I've ever bought, I can look back to that first home I got and my wife and I were like bouncing out of our seats because we were so excited that we were homeowners. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, we have to clean gutters. Oh, we have to trim trees up. Oh, that's right. We have to go buy. Oh, we have to do this. Oh, there's things we should check about this house every once in a while that nobody ever tells you. You just kind of get tossed into it. And this is where I think real estate agents in general, we have an opportunity to allow to be an advocate for that person in their new home, to allow to educate them for years, every single year from that moment they purchase it to the time that they want to sell that house. We should be involved with them saying, hey, have you guys thought about doing this? Have you thought about checking up on this? There are lists out there. We're actually trying to create one right now to help people even go down that path. But there's maintenance lists and all kinds of stuff that as you as a realtor want to create it, you can create a great list of things to go sit down with people and say, hey, have you cleaned your gutters out this year? It sounds silly, but I know there's people on the phone right now that you guys don't are not on the phone. But listening to this recording right now that don't clean your gutters out until they're overflowing with water. 
because I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, you know, and this extends beyond just home ownership. You can even put a list together like this for tenants. So if you're young and in getting into real estate and you end up you're working with a lot of people who are renting or your friends are all renting, how about tips on how to help them lease better, live in their apartments better, things that they can do that are non-permanent that still let them enjoy the place. I see so many people who live in rentals that it looks so sterile because they're afraid to do anything and they don't necessarily enjoy their time there, but there are so many things you can do. So, you know, this list and things extends beyond just home ownership too, and well beyond real estate for those of you who are not necessarily in the real estate field. Oh, I think it, again, it's, it's, yeah, any, any field that you're in, take what your specialty is and sit there and say, well, how can I help people enjoy that part of their life more? So I, I think the way that I've always looked at it, man, the way I've described it is that when, when you get somebody in your database, in your sphere, once you've sold them a home or if you've never sold them a home yet, I've always looked at them like a vegetable in a vegetable garden, like a plant, not the vegetable itself, but the actual plant itself. There's so many aspects of this person's life. Part of it is their, you know, their personal stuff, their relationships, their, their, you know, college that they went to and the sports teams they played on, what their kids do. And we're going to keep in touch with them over that. We also need to have this side over here where we are keeping in touch with them and helping them through whatever that specialty is that we offer, we are, we are involved with them. And if it's real estate, you know, how can we help them stay on top of their home and, and all that and help them be the best homeowner they possibly can? It is inevitable that if you combine those two things and you stay moving forward with them, as far as I've seen it, there's so many one referrals in there and the likelihood of them coming back and using you again down the road is almost 100%. Absolutely. The NAR stat that shows above 80, you know, 80, above 80, 85%. Easily for those of you out there, if you're adding value between the sales, it's going to be 100% for you because the reason why the stat isn't 100% is because there are some, well underperforming agents out there that are not doing well for the clients, they're not going to follow up after the sale anyway. And that's why the stat is where it is because those people have said, you know what, this agent wasn't good. I wouldn't use them again. But for you, if you're listening and you and you pay attention, it's and it's not hard to do for one. So you're going to be able to do business with these people again, no doubt. And then the other thing is, is Garrett, what we tell people and what we've seen is that everybody in your database and anytime you do a transaction or meet somebody who's looking to buy or sell real estate, that's another person you get to add to your database. They have about two referrals to give every single year. Yeah. You know, those referrals, I think a lot of people go like, well, I'm not seeing those. Well, it's not that they have to give them. Right. The opportunity is to give them. <laughs> so a lot of those referrals happen in the way of their friends saying, hey, we're thinking about putting our home in the market. And they go, oh, my gosh, where are you moving to? Instead of them going, hey, do you know Matt Benelli? He's our real estate agent. He's awesome. I got to get you guys connected. Like, don't go talk to anybody else. He's the best. That's what we hope for. But a lot of times it happens the other way. And then God forbid they say another real estate agent that actually is in better flow than you're with them. Man, realtors hold grudges. Have you ever seen that, Matt? Oh, all the time. And I will say from my personal experience of seeing how this works, and it's not even just them referring somebody else or, or not mentioning you. It's, it's mostly the not mentioning. And I've had this with some of my friends when I was starting out in real estate. Oh, I got to talk to my friends. I'll get referrals. So I was in really good flow with my friends when I was starting out. And they sent me referrals. Some of them worked. Some of them didn't. That's fine. We always love getting referrals. And then when I started getting busy, I kind of was too busy to hang out with them, too busy to talk to them. And then I would find out that their friend bought a house. And I'm like, wait a minute. Why didn't you refer them to me? It's like, oh, you know, I, I just forgot. It was, I wasn't even thinking about it. That's right. I should have. And that was at that moment I was like, oh, man, that was my fault. I wasn't talking to these people and I missed out on an opportunity. And that's what will happen. I mean, so and that was with some of my good friends. So, I mean, this isn't like, you know, just talk to people every now and then and they're going to send you referrals. This is an active, ongoing thing that you have to work day in, day out and maintain these relationships. But there's many different ways to do it and everybody's going to be at a different level, right? Well, and my thing is genuine. And that's another side of this that I find with, um, with real estate agents as they start to build this and they start to go down this path is that they do it with the hope of finding more business. And what I want to encourage everybody out there is that the more that you can come from your heart, and if you're going to bother to ask about uh, you know, their daughter that just went off to college and how is she doing getting set up and 
you know, is she going to run in, you know, you try to get into the sorority or whatever that's going to be. You better be asking that question, not for the, the hope that you can have business from them down the road, but because you're truly genuinely interested about that person. If you're going to sit down with them and meet with them about how to become a better homeowner and how to protect their investment and their home, you really need to be coming at it from your heart of saying, I want these guys to have the best homeowner experience that they possibly can have. Not, I'm going to show up, I'm going to do this because this is going to generate me leads and I'm going to be successful because of it. You will be successful because of it. It will happen. I watch it happen day in and day out. But the reality is if your intention is wrong, it will not work. You need to create a system around this of being that value person in their life, but you have to have your heart behind it also at the same time. Otherwise, it's not the system for you. If you don't care about the people uh, this doesn't work. Absolutely. And that's the push pull because you have to know that you're going to get business at that macro level. You want to set goals and you can set strategies and systems to help you engage with people so that you can hit those macro goals. But when you're on that micro level, one-on-one -on -one talking with your people, you can't be thinking, how can I get this person to buy or sell? You have to be thinking, how can I help this person? How can I just bring value to these people? That's what will ultimately lead to business. And that's it's a hard kind of push-pull mindset, but it works. So one thing that I think definitely people can do, particularly when it comes to how you communicate with people after the sale. And we touched on this with the tips on how to own your home better, right? Live in your home better, be a better homeowner, is come up with what you want to do and how you want to communicate with a buyer and a seller after you close. And just build yourself a little calendar. Okay, these are the things that I really want to check in with them on that are real estate related. And here's when I'm going to do it. And set reminders for yourself to do it. That's one very simple way to do it professionally. And then the other side of things is when you get to know things about them, you know their birthdays or their anniversaries, put those things into their contact record so it sinks into your calendar so that you can be reminded of these things. And then you'll get interested. You'll be like, oh, cool, it's John's birthday. I'm going to give him a call because I'm wondering how he's doing. I haven't talked to him in about a month. Those little things will help you take action on staying in touch. What else can everybody do to add value between the sales? One of the things that we teach all the time that it's it's not, I, I find that a lot of people resist it. And this is a whole nother podcast to get into, which is real estate reviews. I think this is another area, again, I know it's another area that a lot of agents miss the boat on. Uh, I've got a gentleman right now, uh, Paul Schneider at the group. We were all we were joking about it on a call we had earlier today because um he was running five for five. The last five real estate reviews that he's done, he's received a referral from every single one of them. And he goes, I'm slipping, I'm slipping. I just did my sixth one and I don't have a referral. I really got to get, you know, figure this out now. But you got to think about that. He sat down with five people in the last two weeks, told them basically, here's where your home stands in the marketplace right now. Here's a couple of comps that directly relate to your property. And do you guys have any questions? And because of sitting down and doing that with them, five out of six times, people within 24 hours, 48 hours afterwards called them up and said, hey, I got to introduce you to so-and-so. Uh, they need to sell their home. And it, you know, that's, a, that's a simple value added, added piece that we could be doing for people. Every single time I see it done, clients love it. If you're a homeowner, anybody who's a homeowner out there right now, if you didn't have access to the MLS, or I mean, obviously we have Zillow at our fingertips and things like that, but if you weren't involved in homes on a day-to-day -day basis, we live our lives, we do our stuff, and all of a sudden years pass and we haven't looked at, you know, where do we stand? We kind of look at the neighbor's houses and stuff. But for someone to come in and be like, here, here's where your house is at value-wise right now. Homeowners love it. They they love the information and, and very few real estate agents give that value. Very few real estate agents give that information. That's a value-added piece, 100%. That's a huge value added piece. And we will do a podcast on that because we'll talk about the right ways to share that value, how to show market trends, things to avoid um, when preparing these reports. There's plenty of that. So we'll get into that. And another thing that we will get into as well is talking about events because I think celebrating the people who are your clients, people who've done business with you, the people who have helped you build your career is very important too. I love events. I'm a huge fan of events. I'm a huge fan of throwing them for your clients, for your neighborhood, and for your friends. And those have lasting impressions too because you have the time leading up to the event that you get to talk about it. 
you have the time at the event where you get to get face to face with people just talking about fun things, what's going on in their lives, bowling with each other, sharing a drink, maybe depending on what type of event you do. And then you have time after to say, hey, cool, look at these cool photos that we took. I think events are another great way in between the sale to stay in touch with your people. Well, I think also, and as we get farther into events, the nice thing is that they're very customizable. There's some people that like to do the 250 you know, people parties. And there's some people that like to do the uh, you know two to three couples over at their house. And so it's very, very customizable. But all of that, again, goes back into bringing, bringing these people back into your world uh, and adding value after the sale. You know, real quick, another thing that, that's crossed my mind that I've seen people do is uh, ticket giveaways specifically after the sale of a home. There's people out there that we haven't learned enough about to easily be able to pick up the phone and make a phone call. And I hear clients all the time say, you know, Garrett, if I just had a reason to call, I could call more people. And any of you guys who haven't done a ticket giveaway out there, I have a lot of my coaching clients that actually buy season tickets to events. They'll buy them to the local baseball team. They'll buy them to the football. Some people buy multiple. A guy in uh, Colorado a couple years back, he had the Rockies. He had the Avalanche. He had the Broncos. He had something else. I was like, oh, my gosh. He goes, I give them all away. He goes, I have a reason to call all the time because I'm giving tickets away to some event that I can't get to, but they use those tickets in a way so that they can reach back out and, and call or talk to those people that they sold a home to you know, in the last you know, one, two years and reconnect with them. But that's a great reason, a confident reason for them that they can pick up the phone and make a phone call. I love that. So ticket giveaways, guys, you can, you can do this with sporting events. You can do this with art events, cultural events, and it doesn't even have to be season tickets. Maybe there's a big thing coming to town. Like here in Charleston, they do the Charleston Wine and Food Festival and emphasis on the wine before the food most of the time. But there's all these different things that they do and it's lots of fun. And those tickets do sell out if you're not buying them early on. And so, you know, you could, if you have something like that, that comes to your town, you can buy up some tickets early on and then share them with your people. Do your events, hosting in your home or hosting somewhere else. Real estate reviews, we'll talk more about the taxes and strategies behind that, but just simply giving people market updates every year and being their actual real estate advisor, getting rid of that term past client, just having your clients and advising them every year, and then knowing about them so that you can follow up with them on birthdays for important things. If you know that someone really loves cars, for example, and there's a brand new car that's coming out and it's all the talk of the town. And you see the newspaper article talking about when this thing's going to be released. And you can call up that one person and say, hey, have you seen this? Or send them a note saying, did you see this? This is really cool. It's going to be on display at the auto show next month. Those are ways that you can connect with your people between the sale and really add some value. So start by knowing your people. And then you can get all of these other things from that as well, right? Yeah, I used to have a guy that used to know what his client's favorite coffee drinks were. And he just had a couple people he paid attention to. He didn't do it for everybody. But if he learned it, like there's one lady, she liked the gingerbread latte that Starbucks used to put out. I think they still do. He used to wash for that thing. And the first it came out, he would go grab one and go head off to her office and drop it off on her desk. And you know, those are those little things that make people stop and just be like, oh my gosh, he actually pays attention to me. He knows what's important to me. And that's the stuff that makes people come back and stick with you long term. And that's the key, right? It doesn't have to be the same thing for everybody. And you don't have to do it with everybody. You guys will have the people that you like more than other people that you do business with. So focus on the people that you enjoy connecting with and connect with them. One way that you can maybe get started on this that might help too is just take a look at your database and go through it and look at those names and think about each person a little bit and think about, you know, what is John into? What is Betty into? And then see if you can create a connection there and find a reason to call and start there. Just yeah. start doing something to connect with people genuinely with real genuine interest in them. And that's where you'll be able to figure out even more ways to add that value. Well, and I think to kind of wrap this up, I, I want to go back to is what we first started on, which is, you know, I want you all to be thinking about it starts when you first meet somebody. It doesn't start when you decide you want to stay in better flow with somebody. It starts when you first meet somebody. And this is anybody you've ever met in your life. The first time you meet with them, that's the opportunity to start learning what's important to them. The more you learn, the more you gather, the easier it's going to be able to stay in touch with them long term. The less you know, the less you gather, the harder it's going to be to follow up with them. Gather what you can right from the get-go, and it will always be easier. Way harder to go back, though. So I think that would be the point. Love it. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye. 
Thank you for joining us here on the Ninja Coaching Coast to Coast podcast. We appreciate your time and attention. If you receive some value out of this episode, we would love for you to share it, subscribe to the podcast, and if you feel so compelled, to leave us a review. Have an amazing day. We'll see you soon. Oh,